And now for some quick intros. Dr. Dick Schwartz is the creator of Internal Family Systems, a highly effective evidence-based therapeutic model that depathologizes the multi-part personality. His IFS Institute offers training for professionals and the public. Formerly an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Illinois at Chicago and later at Northwestern, he is currently on the faculty of Harvard Medical School. He has published five books and is a sought-after presenter. Nancy Burgoyne is the Chief Clinical Officer at the Family Institute at Northwestern University, a fan sponsor, beloved fan sponsor. She is a faculty member in the Master of Science in Marriage and Family Therapy program, a licensed clinical psychologist, and a family therapist who abides by the scientist-practitioner model. We have Dr. Burgoyne to thank for connecting us to Dick. I've asked her to mention briefly how they know each other. And now let's welcome Dick Schwartz and Nancy Burgoyne. Thank you, Lonnie. Hi, Dick. Hi, Nancy. <laughs> Hi, thank you also, Lonnie and Anne-Marie, and great to get to know you by both. And uh, it's great to be with you again, Nancy. Great to be with you too, Dick. I had the privilege, this is a full circle moment for me, because I had the privilege of being an intern uh, when Dick was a professor at U of I and was writing his very first book uh, in IFS. And I got to be part of that process and learning alongside. And I've had three plus decades now of living this model. Um, and so it is it is this incredible full circle moment to be doing this with you. So thank you so much for doing it. And I'm so happy to be have the opportunity to share this with a larger audience. And I remember those days very fondly. Those were really, really fun, free, you know, free spirited times and yeah. uh, and wild experimentation and learning and and uh, you were all you were there for all of it. It's a it's a rare it was a rare opportunity, something that uh, we don't we don't get enough of in terms of uh, freedom to experiment and explore these days. So um, and and so much came out of it. So, so today, we, I know that this is a grand rounds, and you had an event last night as well, more for a public audience, a lay audience. And as a grand rounds, we likely have uh, largely clinicians here, given by how many have signed up for CEUs. And I know at the Family Institute, we have many graduate students. This is IFS is part of what they're exposed to in their training in the marriage and family therapy program. So we have many students here. So our conversation is going to be pretty clinical. Um, for those who have not had any exposure to IFS, I was wondering if you could start by explaining how you really discovered, because that's how you talk about the model is a discovery, um, in your very earliest work with folks who struggled with eating disorders. Yeah, so this was... Uh... I think maybe about seven or eight years before you came along. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, like you, have a, uh, I'm trained as a family therapist and have a PhD in that. And I was one of those obnoxious family therapists who felt like we found the Holy Grail. And mm -hmm. all we needed to do was reorganize these family structures. And the, the kid would just totally shift and stop doing, stop acting out. and wanted to prove that. So back at the Institute for Juvenile Research, where we both were, uh, I organized with Mary Jo Barrett, who's a local uh, prominent therapist, trauma therapist, mm -hmm. um, an outcome study with bulimia, because Mnuchin claimed to have such great results with anorexia. And so we contacted a local eating disorder treatment uh, um, support group. Mm -hmm. And they referred a bunch of bulimic kids to us. And, and so we set out to do structural strategic family therapy with 30 or so of these families and uh, found that at least my clients weren't, you know, prophecies were failing, that the kids kept binging and purging despite how much we changed the families. Oh. And so I got curious about that and, and started asking why. And they started teaching this to me because they started mm -hmm. talking this language of parts and they would say some version of when something bad happens in my life it triggers this critic and then that that critic can make me feel totally worthless and alone and empty and that part 
is so dreadful to feel that the binge comes to take me away from it. But then the act of the binge triggers the critic again, which makes me feel worthless again. And so the binge has to come back. And so they right. in that vicious circle uh, that you know we're both familiar with now. Yeah. For days sometimes. And so I, you know, I kind of put on my family therapy hat because this is the sequences we were studying in families. Right. And thought, how can I, how can we change this inner system? Yeah. And so how would you say though, because you're talking about um parts showing up and clients sort of sharing these parts with you. How is that different than conflicting thoughts? Right? Because people will say, you know, I have one mind and I think a couple of different things and I might want to do this and I might want to do that. And that's a common experience. And maybe as somebody struggling with an eating disorder, their thoughts are a little bit more extreme. But that's yeah. what you're talking about here is conflicting thoughts. No, and, and that's what I thought they were talking about initially. Yeah. And I, I sort of went that way. I said, okay, they're irrational. Let's try and, and uh, do some, like, uh, you know, CBT and, and try to argue them out of doing what they're doing and telling them how irrational they are. And that didn't work. It just made it worse. And as my clients kept insisting that they weren't just little thoughts, that they actually had full range personalities. At some point I started to buy into that and started to explore that. And that's turned out to be, uh, you know, I, I think I was lucky in the sense that I hadn't studied psychodynamic therapy. And so I didn't have a lot of presumptions to bring to the phenomena. And so I was forced to actually believe a lot of what my clients were teaching me. Mm -hmm. And over and over, they kept saying, no, it's not just a thought. There's a lot more to it. And at some point, I started taking them seriously. And still, because I, I thought, you know, initially, I thought the critic was just some kind of internalized parental voice, which is yeah. most psychotherapy thinks of it. I would have my clients argue with it and control the binge. It's just an out of control impulse. But as I had them do this, the, the parts were fighting back and they were talking about how they're much more than what we thought. And long story short, at some point, I came to realize that they aren't what they seem, that they're actually these inner personalities who, before they're hurt or burdened in, in our language, are valuable, inner, that, we're, that we're born with. Uh, we come into the world with them and they all have qualities to help us in our life, but trauma and attachment injuries and so on force them into these roles that can be quite extreme. But you're right. Initially, I thought that's all they were. Well, and that's a pretty important differentiator, right? There's, there's a difference between having internalized something that then you're trying to extract than a burden attaching itself to a part that's already there and taking it over and leading it to be extreme. That's, yeah. th those are different things and they lead to a different way of responding and relating to the parts clinically and, and intrapsychically inside of ourselves. Yeah, I mean, exactly. <clears throat> if you think of them just as extreme thoughts or emotions, then it makes sense to try and control them and, and do that kind of thing. But if they're, valuable inner entities that got stuck with that internalization, for lack of a better word, of, of you, you know, you're worthless or the world is dangerous. So these are some common burdens that these parts wind up carrying. And, and once they attach to the part, they do govern its existence. So I can understand why a lot of psychotherapy thinks that's all they are. Mm -hmm. But it's possible for these parts to actually unload those thoughts and emotions, at which point they'll, it's like a curse has been lifted and they'll mm -hmm. transform into their naturally valuable states, which mm -hmm. amazed me. I was just totally amazed as we started to discover that shortly before you came along. Yeah, I think that's one of the, the things that that's stunning when you're doing the work is when you trust and follow the lead of the part and you're carrying that belief 
of inherent goodness in the part, then, then you, you get a different result than if you're carrying a different belief about the, the part that you're interacting with as a clinician. Yeah, because if you see it in the former way, then you're going to, you, you know, yourself personally, but your client, you're going to encourage your clients to actually get curious about it rather than to yes. try and manipulate it. And when they get curious, and instead of fighting with it, they start to ask, what is it you want me to know? And why are you doing this in there? Uh, you'd be amazed at the answers people get. Mm -hmm. so quite remarkable. It is. It is remarkable. And yeah, your book, the title of your book, No Bad Parts. We have clinicians here who are working with folks who have been abusive to people, who have been abusive to themselves, who have done some pretty horrible things in their lives and treated themselves very badly. No bad parts. How do you how do you reconcile that? How do you reconcile the the acting out, the bad behavior, the really problematic things that folks do with that yeah. freight? Yeah. So, you know, I, I was working with the bulimics and, you know, as we approached the binging part, for example, with curiosity, we learned what it was doing and why, and we could show it appreciation and learn about what it was protecting and and help it out of that role. And we could do the same with these critics. So I thought, okay, that's interesting that these things aren't what they seem, but what about those parts that molest little kids or, or rape people? Mm -hmm. and at some point I was fortunate to uh, consult to a sex offender treatment center in Illinois called Onarga Academy. I don't even know if it still exists mm -hmm. for several years and was able to experiment with a lot of the, the people there and indeed learned that the parts that had done the raping or the molesting had their own stories of how they got forced into their roles and carried the energy of their perpetrator and, mm -hmm. and so on and so on. And, and so it wasn't until I had that experience that I could actually conclude that indeed there are no bad parts. And so Mm -hmm. That's true of, uh, you know, this was a topic yesterday, uh, suicidal parts and so on, that mm -hmm. in some way, they're all trying their best to protect. Even mm -hmm. the ones that kill you think that's better than having to suffer all the time the way you do. Mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a radical, you know, a radical, radically different paradigm for understanding the mind. Uh, and it has radical implications for how we need to relate to ourselves. So how is that how is that different in working with folks than giving permission for the behaviors? If you're understanding it, if it makes sense to you, if you understand why someone might, for example, be suicidal and it wants them to be relieved from their unbearable suffering. And they, it seems that if I don't tell them I'm, this person's going to continue to suffer, if I don't do this horrible thing, then I'm going to be dealing with these unbearable feelings. Even if it's a solution for the person, how is it not giving permission? Because in addition to letting us, to letting it know that we're getting that it's trying to protect and actually honoring it, like you might the military for its service, mm -hmm. we're also asking for permission from, in this case, the suicidal part to go to the parts that carry the pain and, and, and offering an alternative way to deal with the pain. And what we find over and over is if these suicidal parts trust there is an alternative, they don't want you to die. They, they know they're going down with the ship. Mm -hmm. So I become what I call a hope merchant. And I'm selling hope to these parts that feel totally hopeless about any alternative. And getting permission then to go to the the parts that carry the pain and the shame and the terror that they're really trying to, to get away from. And, and then we have a process for actually healing and transforming those parts, unloading that pain. And then we come back to the suicidal part and now it doesn't want to kill you. It wants to do something entirely different. Yeah, it's, it, I'm sure it's, it's challenging for folks to, who, who aren't as familiar to sort of trust that it's a process 
that as all therapy is a process to sort of move people into these less extreme states. Mm -hmm. But something that you mentioned when you were talking is you're talking about a system inside. Mm -hmm. We're not, you're not just dealing with a part. So there are other parts who are, have other agendas and other hopes and needs. Can you talk a little bit about the structure of the internal world and how you came to understand it that way? Yeah, thanks for that question. And again, I think my unique, not unique, but my background in systems thinking and family therapy really helped me not just focus on one part at a time, but to understand the network of relationships and how what a delicate ecology this is inside of us and, mm -hmm. and be more and more respectful of that as I got to know it. And so as a family therapist and a systems thinker, I was looking for these patterns and what's the distinctions among these different roles the parts are in. And the distinction that leaped out immediately was between the parts that other systems might call inner children that are very young and innocent and before they're hurt, give us all kinds of delightful emotions and, and curiosity and, and joy and creativity. But they're the ones, because they're so sensitive, they get hurt the most by the traumas we suffer or the betrayals or the rejections or the, the shaming that we undergo. And so they wind up carrying these very intense burdens, these extreme emotions like sense of worthlessness and shame or terror from a, a trauma or uh, a, a emotional pain. And when they, get hurt like that, they have the power to overwhelm us and to make it so it's hard for us to function or even think. Yeah. And so we almost naturally try to lock them away in inner basements or abysses. And everybody around us, because this is a rugged individualist culture, tells us to just move on from the trauma, to just yeah. let all that go, don't think about it, and just move on. And so we wind up thinking we're just moving on from the memories or even the emotions and letting it go. But indeed, instead, we're locking away our most precious assets simply because they got hurt. And so those we, I came to call the exiles. <laughs> and, uh, most everybody has some and people, the kind of clients that you and I work with a lot have lots of them because their childhoods were so, so bad or because they grew up in a family where certain parts weren't accepted. Like you couldn't be angry in this family or you couldn't mm -hmm. be vulnerable. And so, mm -hmm. so people had to lock all that away too. So, and when you get a lot of these exiles, you feel more delicate, the world seems more dangerous because so many things could trigger them. And like I said before, when they get triggered, they burst out of exile and they can totally overwhelm you with their emotions and make it so you can't function. And so to prevent that, then a bunch of other parts have to leave their naturally valuable roles or states and become protectors. And uh, should I keep going? Like there yeah, are, keep going. No, absolutely. There are two classes of protectors. Um, most of us are blend, our language is blended with what we call managers, whose job it is to manage the external world so that things don't trigger our exiles. And so they're, they're often very eager to you know, prevent anybody from getting close enough to hurt us again or to make us look perfect so nobody rejects us or to, to make us strive and achieve so that we get accolades to counter the worthlessness or, or make us take care of everybody else and focus on their needs so they like us and depend on us, but don't let us take care of ourselves. And so there's a whole host of common manager roles that, again, most of us and, and people like you and I who've achieved a certain amount depended on a lot of the time to get us here. Yeah. Uh, but they have in common an attempt to contain the exiles by controlling everything and by pleasing everybody doesn't always work, exile gets triggered, big emergency, explosion of feelings. So there are other parts who are on standby and immediately go into action to take us away from those feelings. And 
Uh, so they're fighting the fire of exiled pain or shame or terror. So we call them firefighters. Mm -hmm. Emergency responders who will get you higher than the flames or douse it with some substance or distract you till it burns itself out. And we've all got a hierarchy of those. Mm -hmm. First one doesn't work, you go to the next one. And what we started with is suicide and it's usually at the top of that hierarchy. The flames get hot enough, there's this ultimate solution to that. That's a big relief for most people. But before you get to that point, there's addictions and there's rage and there's dissociation and mm -hmm. all kinds of common firefighter activities. Numbing. Mm -hmm. Numbing. So this is the map that I sort of sorted out as I was learning about all this. And it's held up these 40 years as a pretty, uh, it's held up pretty well as yeah. a map to the territory. Pretty simple, again, exiles protected by managers and firefighters, sometimes who are fighting with each other over the best way to protect the exiles. Uh, and yeah, so that's the, the, the map to the territory. Seems like seems like nobody in the system especially likes the firefighters, though they though they rely on them. Those kinds of behaviors that we show up with that um, that numb us and do extreme things. Managers may not be fans of that, and it's certainly hurting the exiles. But yeah. but um, they have they have a nasty job. Yeah, they're they're very underappreciated because they don't care about the collateral damage. To your relationships or your body they just know they've got to do their job and yeah. and then the managers see that they take you out of control and the managers are trying to keep you in control so they up their criticism they become these nasty inner critics why can't you control yourself why are you so impulsive why can't you just uh not do that why don't yeah. you just stop victim? it just stop it yeah mm -hmm. and uh and both of them get into these big polarizations all the time, neither of which really realize that they're just fighting over how best to handle all this pain in there. Yeah. Yeah, it's a completely different lens to see it as fighting over all of that pain in there. And when you're standing in a position of trusting that and believing that, the, the work is uh, the work moves very differently. Yeah. There's a, there's a pattern that I've noticed that in my work a lot lately, which is a little less of a flash of a firefighter that causes problems, but this slow chronic burn of ignoring exiles, of ignoring needs, of having managers in part um, in charge without necessarily firefighters showing up in a vivid way that creates these sort of chronic conditions, this, this sort of um, long-term deprivation, I guess I would I would call it. Yeah, I mean, some people are dominated by, you know, the only distinction between manager and the firefighter is the point in the sequence. So yeah. if it is a chronic thing that's sort of with you every day and you're a little bit out of your body and that's what's protecting you, then it's probably a manager just trying to manage it all. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's that's very common. Yeah, I want to just go back to um, back to burdens for a bit. Um, because you talked about parts carry these burdens, it's what they carry. And there are a couple of different kinds of burdens that you talk about. I know that in my work um, on myself, it's really been, excuse me, I'm sorry, folks, I have a cold. It's really been the legacy burdens that have really uh, cost me. Excuse me. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry about that. It's fine. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so when when I started to f try to figure out how to help these parts transform, and they would talk about these extreme beliefs and emotions they carried, then I became very interested in how to help them unload those. And some of uh, one of the things we learned was for parts to be willing to let go of this stuff, they needed for you to finally get what happened in the past where they were frozen in time when they got the burdens. And so I would, I would have helped you, Nancy, 
to witness where they were stuck in the past. And that can be a very emotional process. And yeah, you know, I just encourage you to feel it all and see and sense everything about how bad it was back there until the part felt fully witnessed. And then I would have you, because it is frozen in time, go into the scene it was stuck in and get it out of there. And then once we had it, had retrieved it, it's willing to give these things up. And then as I was learning about that, people would say, well, I see my father and it's not about me, it's about what happened to him or even further back in their ancestry. And it became clear that while we pick up a lot of burdens in our personal histories, there are also burdens that come down into our systems that have nothing to do with what happened to us, but have everything to do with <clears throat> what happened to our ancestors or to our ethnic group or, or are just floating around in our American culture. Yeah. And attached to these parts and drive the way they operate. So it sounds like uh, you found some legacy burdens. Yeah, absolutely. I can't think of a, a, a more stunning moment in my own work that unfolded just like that, even going into it, sort of being aware of that, sort of stepping into this space where I'm encountering things that weren't mine, weren't in my history, weren't my memories, but were the memories of my mother um, and her experience, especially her gendered experience, and how I took that in through the ether. Um, and it was living in my body in a very physical way. Um, and I, I don't, I mean, I'm sure I, intellectually, I, I might have, have bought it, but uh, I know that IFS is very invested in uh, their clinicians having the experiences. And certainly for me, having the experience of that was, was a stunning um, a, a stunning awakening of how much we can sort of take in and carry on the road with us. Yeah, so say more about the impact of that, your mother is the legacy burden from your mother and, and what it did to your life before and after you unloaded it. Yeah, I always felt that I carried more internalized sexism than made complete sense in the generation that I was raised. And I'm certainly being raised in the 60s and 70s, there was plenty of it. But what I carried was um, much more disparaging, much more critical, much harsher, and much more violent than was my experience. And so when I got in touch with this legacy burden, I was hearing things about myself that were about myself, excuse me, that were about my mother. And so I had that conversation with her. I was blessed to have a mother who was open that way wow. uh, and was able to have that conversation with her. But the, I, I, will, I will say that, um, I will say that there was um, a, an instant magical, I don't feel that anymore, um, but I will say that there was a softening in my relationship with the part that carried those messages of you shouldn't, you shouldn't be there, you shouldn't take up space, you should do what he says, those kinds of things. That I was able to sort of lovingly manage when I understood better where it came from. Yeah. And does that part still carry that, uh, that legacy burden? Can you tell? Yeah, I think so. It's not, it's transformed. It's not the same. And just for the audience to know, it, Dick and I had a conversation about the value of uh, role plays and the personal part of this so that, that you can all be comfortable that I'm comfortable. Um, it, it's not the same. It's it's evolved and it's changed and it's transformed. Um, but I still I still hear from her. I still hear from her uh, uh, in, in many, many contexts, especially in a context like this where I'm putting myself out there. Well, speaking of role plays, if you wanted, we could just get to know her a little better and see if there's more she'd like to unload. Yeah, let, let's do let's do a few minutes with that, and then and then I I have a couple other places I want to go. But let's for the benefit of the audience and for me. Okay, let's sounds do good. That. Yeah.
So Nancy, go ahead and focus on the way you experience her in there and tell me where you find her in your body or around your body. Well, she lives like a gripping in my throat. Okay. And as you notice her there, how are you feeling toward her right now? Well, and I, I, I thank a wonderful therapist for this, but I feel very lovingly towards her. Um, and I know that she is, you know, she sort of thinks out and isn't entirely sure that she should take up this kind of space. Um, so you can kind of see her peeking out, is that right? Yeah, she, I, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't experience my parts that visually but I have the felt experience of this. It's the best way I can describe it, just like peeking out, even though I don't see that, I yeah, sense I, that. I, my system works the same way. So yeah. Can you do you have a sense of how close you are in terms of feet away in there? Oh, she's she's right here. Okay, good. Yeah, so do let her know again that you, care about her and you have compassion for her and uh, that it is safe for her to come out more now. She feels, uh, she feels bad for my mom. Okay. Mm -hmm. So ask her more about that. She feels sad that, um, my mother couldn't benefit from the types of things that I've benefited from and that she lived in a very shadowed place. Your mother's gone now, is that right? Yes. Okay, does that make sense that she would feel that way? Yeah, makes complete sense. Well, let her know you get that. And ask her if that's partly why she still carries some of that mother energy. Mm. Yeah, it feels like loyalty. Yeah, that's what I thought. So it would feel disloyal to give it all up. Is that right? Yeah. So Nancy, what do you say to her about that? Well, I get a lot of chatter from other parts that agree that she shouldn't give it up because of the loyalty that I feel towards my mother. Mm -hmm. um, but I also hear when I can contact myself more, I hear permission. I hear it's okay. So just tell her that. You've been a good daughter. You can, yeah. you can let see, go. See if she can buy into that any more than she has. Just see if she can believe you or not. She's listening. Okay. Um, you know, the, we could negotiate something like, would she be interested in not taking it, not carrying it in her body, but maybe putting it in a box so it, we wouldn't get rid of it entirely? Mm -hmm. a way to honor it somehow without her having to carry it. So you could ask about something like that. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. I have things of hers that I could, I could put, I could place it there. Okay. So in the inner world, why don't you ask this part to go ahead and put it out of her body into those that, those things of hers? Okay. 
And now see how the part feels without all that. It feels a little like a wobbly cult. Okay. Like at its sea legs and another another thought. Good. And tell if it if it wants to invite invite into its body now qualities it would like to have. Okay. Something came in? Well, it was interesting that gentleness came in. Good. So how's the part doing now? Softer. Okay, good. Yeah, softer. Yeah, and all these other parts that were worried about the loyalty thing, just check in with them and see how they're doing with this shift. I think they're they're cautious, and I think they'll need to be connected with, which I'll do. Okay, sounds good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how's it feeling in there now? It feels good and it feels familiar to me because I've done this work. And so doing this work and doing it live now for you and for the benefit of those watching feels a little bit different because it's less private. Yeah. Um, but it feels familiar in terms of me contacting me and then contacting my inner world and having an exchange with it. Okay. Okay, so why don't we shift back outside? Thank your parts for letting us do this, especially in this context. Yeah, sure. Okay. So thanks for doing that. It was a really good example of uh, negotiating an unburdening of a legacy burden and the loyalty issue is a big one. It comes up frequently Huge. when we go to do that. So, and that's one way that I have of trying to, to deal with that issue. Well, I appreciate the demonstration. I appreciate the opportunity to do that with you. That was great for me. And I appreciate the demonstration. The thing I really wanna zero in on that we haven't talk too much about what is so core and central is the, the 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 cornerstone of the entire model which is the self that's right and how it's different than how self is thought of typically which is integration with the goal being integration so can you talk a little bit about about self and self energy and why it's important for a therapist to be in self energy when they're working and, and what we're trying to accomplish for our clients? Yeah, so if we go back to those early discovery days, uh, I, once I got hip to the fact that parts aren't what they seem and they deserve to be listened to, I would try to have clients listen to them. And so maybe I'm having you try to listen to your critic and suddenly you hate your critic and mm -hmm. reminded me of times in family sessions where I'm having two family members talk to each other and a third party interferes and screws it all up. And so I would say, Nancy, could you find the one who's angry at the critic and could you get it to step out or relax back? And people could do it. And you know, while we were working with your legacy burden and you had all these other parts that agreed with it about the loyalty, mm -hmm. it interfered in a big way. I would have asked you to get them into a waiting room or just to step back more. Uh, and what I found when I got clients to do that, to separate from some of these interfering parts, was it would release this other person who, instead of feeling angry or afraid, suddenly would say, I'm just curious about why this critic calls me names. Mm -hmm. And would say it with calm and confidence and even compassion a lot of the time. 
And the critic would respond really well to this person and would be vulnerable enough to share its secret history. And so as I tried that same process with other clients, I found the same person would pop out basically with those same C word qualities and four others. So at some point I would ask clients, now what part of you was that? Because that's great. And they said, that's just me, that's myself, that's not a part. So I started calling that the self with a capital S to distinguish it from the common use of the word. And it turns out now, 40 years later, thousands of clients later, thousands of people like you using this model all over the world, everybody's got that self. It's mm -hmm. in everybody, can't be damaged, knows how to heal, and is just beneath the surface of these parts such that when they open space, it comes out spontaneously and starts to, you know, I could hand the baton over to you and ask you, what do you want to say to this, uh, to this girl with the legacy burden? Mm -hmm. And you knew what to say. Mm -hmm. And so that's the big deal about IFS, that uh, we have a way to access that place that some people think of as, as being grounded, but it's, you know, characterized by calm, curious, curiosity, uh, confidence, compassion, courage, creativity, clarity, and connectedness. Those are what we call the eight C's of self-leadership. And so before I have anybody work with their parts, I'll ask this question, how do you feel toward the part? And if it isn't one of those C words, then I'll ask whatever parts are giving the other feelings to open space until we get, I'm at least curious about it. And then we have the person start to work with it. Can you call to it? Can you, can you call to someone's compassion? Can you tell them to practice compassion and have that sort of activate or access? You know, uh, some spiritual traditions do that. There's a, build up the muscle of compassion idea in a lot of Buddhist traditions, for example. Mm -hmm. This is a bit different in the sense that if you, if you try, it may activate protectors who don't want you to feel that way. Yep. So rather than trying to exercise and get you know, resistance all the time, we'll go to the parts that might be afraid to let you feel compassion and work with them to the point of them separating enough that you just feel it. You don't have to build up the muscle. It's already there. Mm -hmm. This is a different paradigm in that way too. Yeah, it is a different paradigm in that way. And I think that's 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 an important distinction. And it, it, it bypasses a lot of resistance, you know, because you're not, you don't get in your power struggle with parts this way. You're calling to things that you trust are already there. And with that space, you know, they, they show up for you eventually. Yeah, generally, we'll start with the resistance. So let's focus on the part that's afraid to let you be in therapy or, the, or that's afraid to let you go to these dark places inside. And we'll get to know it and honor it for its protective role in, in your life. And then negotiate permission uh, and go over all of its fears about what's it afraid would happen if it lets you open the door to that stuff. And I would then address those fears. This is how we're going to handle this one. I'm not going to be judging you, even though you worry so much about that. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a way to handle it so you're not overwhelmed by what comes out of there. So those are a couple of the common fears these protectors have. Yep. But there's a whole list of like nine of them, common fears that we've learned how to address each of them. Yeah, it's amazing. It's, it's fascinating you say that. I'm thinking about trauma specifically now and uh, the movement in the field. And I know you collaborate with Russell Vandercoke and um, I, I got a, a text message last night when you were presenting from somebody that is learning somatic experiencing that was very struck by how somatic and experiential the work was that you were doing last night and even the work that a little bit of work that you and I just did. Um, I'm wondering how you think about that because IFS was originally really thought of as kind of a cognitive model. 
And I actually think about it as an experiential model. And I'm wondering what you, how you see yourself fitting with the thinking of the trauma being stored in the body and the, the, the limbic system as it's been referred to sometimes, et cetera. Yeah, um, you know, things have evolved over the years. And in the early days, I was very fortunate to collaborate with a guy named Ron Kurtz, who developed something called Hakomi, mm -hmm. which actually did have a big influence on Peter Levine and somatic experiencing, and uh, and picked up how important it was to locate the parts in the body and then focus on how they're they're guiding you in the body and how they're re they're coming how they're reacting to various things and and so it became a much more somatic based model and how much how important it was to keep the thinking parts from interfering because most people when you ask them a question they're used to being in therapy where their thinking parts can come up with the answer yep. and i just moved back from to chicago from boston and virtually everybody is massively uh, in their head in Boston. So I got very good at just, okay, before we do anything else, we're gonna ask those thinking parts to go offline. And I just want you to focus on the experience of these other parts in your body. And then when you ask them a question, don't think, just wait and see what comes and how your body moves or wants to move and all of that. So yeah, so it's it's a far cry now from any kind of cognitive based yeah, it, 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 even it, down to the, the micro moments where I will say to people, don't think, just listen to what comes up. Yeah. You know, don't think your way there, just listen to what comes up from your body. That makes sense. Yeah. And you know, uh, what? Yeah. Sorry. I was going to say, it's not necessarily coming from your body. The parts are inhabiting your body, and it's coming okay. from the parts that are letting you know something and using your body to let you know that. Hmm. Good distinction. Good distinction. Okay. I'd like to offer something to all of our attendees, many of whom I know are clinicians who are working with uh, folks day in and day out and doing that difficult work, and many working with folks who have trauma and how challenging that work is. And because this model is so experiential, um, I wanted to see if you would be up for walking us through an exercise to, in our last 10 minutes here, to increase our sense of internal connection to ourselves. Happy to do that. Um, yeah, so as you, the listener, have been listening, you probably have started to think about different parts of you. Mm. And I'm going to invite you to maybe get to know one of your protectors. We're not going to go anywhere near an exile in this exercise, but if there is a protector of some kind, and if you can't think of any, most people have a critic, so you could just start there. Um, so I'm going to invite you to get comfortable and take a second and then focus in on that, that the voice or the sensation or the emotion of that protective part of you. And notice it in your body or around your body, just to kind of get a, get a grounding place in there. And then once you get a sense of it, I'm gonna ask this kind of odd question, which is how do you feel toward this part of you? And by that, I mean, you have a relationship with it. You, you interact with it probably one way or another. And so how do you feel toward it? And if the answer to that question isn't one of those C words. If instead you don't like it or you're afraid of it or, or you like it a huge amount, <laughs> you depend on it, then that would be other parts. 
And so we're going to ask those other parts just for a few minutes to relax back so you can get to know this protector maybe in a different way. We're not going to give it more power. We're just going to get to know it and maybe even help it not have to do its job so much. So see if those other ones could just separate a little bit more so you could get curious about it. And if you can get to that open-minded kind of curious place, then go ahead and ask this part what it wants you to know about itself. Like we were just saying, don't think of the answer, just wait and see what comes to you from that place in your body. The follow-up question to that is, ask the part what it's afraid would happen if it didn't do this inside of you. And again, wait for the answer, don't think. If it answered that question, then you learn something about how it's trying to protect you. So see if you can extend some appreciation to it for at least trying to help you, even if it backfires and doesn't work. Just let it know you get that it's just trying to help and see how it reacts to your appreciation. And then ask it if you could change or heal what it's protecting in there so that it was freed up and it didn't have to do this job anymore. What might it like to do instead inside of you? I'll repeat that. If you can change or heal what it protects so it was liberated, what might it like to do instead? And then two more questions and we'll shift. First is ask this protector how old it thinks you are and wait for the answer. And if it got that wrong, then go ahead and update it and see how it reacts to that information. And the last question is ask the part what it needs from you going forward in the future. Just wait for the answer.
And when that all feels complete, then just shift your focus back out here and thank your parts for whatever they let you know. And welcome back, Nancy. Uh, are you up for describing what you experienced? Sure. Um, and we have just a couple of minutes. So I, I actually just spontaneously went back to the parts that reacted to the legacy work that we did earlier today. And um, they were um, they, they were aware of my age, which I thought was very interesting. That surprised me. Um, but they were, their, their concern was that if I let go of my loyalty to my mother, that I would be underestimating, um, I would be underestimating the impact of sexism on her life and mine and that of many women. Mm -hmm and that I would be minimizing that and that that was not okay. That's great. And did you uh, respond to them? About all yeah, that? That, that I could hold both truths. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. So it was relieving to them. Very relieving to them. It's great. Yeah, really great. Who knew I would get, I would get a bonus <laughs> therapy session out of the deal. <laughs> We have just a couple of more minutes, Dick. I, I honestly can't thank you enough for the opportunity and for sharing. I know that your uh, trainings are often full and we heard from some folks uh, before that, they were, that that was hard, that people were trying to get in. And I know it's a quality issue for you and you're very invested in the, uh, the quality of the folks who are doing the work. Um, and so I would just encourage patients um, as folks are trying to get access to your trainings. Thank you, Nancy, and welcome back, Bonnie. Hi, welcome back, um, Dick and Nancy. Thank you for such a thorough, explored, exploratory, <laughs> um, open, um, informative 60 minutes. I know that you gave great value to all the clinicians watching and for all of the regular folks like me and Anne-Marie who are uh, tuning in and learning through osmosis almost. So thank you so much. Very, very much appreciate it. Um, a reminder, Anne-Marie has been putting, if you arrived late and you did not open chat, do open chat very quickly. Anne-Marie has been dropping in. If you're looking for CEUs, clinicians need to fill out a survey monkey survey for the Family Institute, which is granting the CEUs. She's been posting that link a couple of times. She'll post it one more time for folks so that you have it. Um, so make sure you grab it. You'll need to fill out that um, that survey and we'll be in Family Institute will be in touch with you about uh, the process for CEUs. Uh, Dix, thank you so much. I'm glad that you're back in the area. Um, it's glad to have you in the fan family. And Nancy, you know, we we love your work. Thank you so much. Such a great event with Gabor Mate earlier this year. Um, you know, you're one of our favorites, part of the family. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you so much. And more thank soon. You, thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Ari. And glad to be part of the fan family. <laughs> we'll <have you> back. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take have care, everybody. Time.